Hey everybody, it's Bob Lorenz. I'm in my home office, thousands of miles away. It's Ian Joy, my Yes Network colleague. We are practicing the ultimate social distancing, right? We're doing it right. Yes, we are. <laughs> Doesn't get further than this. So hope everybody else is as well. You're being safe, you're with your families. I think that's kind of the sort of the byproduct of this, right? That you're spending more time at home with your family, face-to-face -face conversations, right? I think it's really important that people recognize how important it is to be following the steps and making sure you are self-isolating with your family away. I'm going to say this, Bob. I'm actually seeing this as a little bit of a blessing in disguise, an opportunity to sort of slow down from the crazy routine of lice, the, the rat race, so to say. And then all of a sudden you get this moment where you're stuck with your family in the four walls looking at each other for the first time in a long time. No plane to catch, no car waiting for you, no studio to get to. All of a sudden you've got now this quality family time. So I'm seeing it and treating it as a little bit of a blessing in disguise. And it's great at this moment in time to spend, of course, this time with the family. It's unfortunate the circumstances that we're under, but I hope everybody's following suit. Yeah, I, I hope so, too. I think it will make things a lot easier. You always hear that term flattening the curve, but it is important. You know, I always think about this because I have had to go out a couple of times to go get groceries, that kind of thing. Yeah. And it's after I've isolated for five, six days. Right. And so I'm wondering, like, did I just reset my clock or am I doing the right things when I'm out to make sure, OK, you know what? You're fine. You're doing exactly what you need to do. But I'm confident of that. We have some gloves. We have hand sanitizers that sort of thing. So again, not getting out there very often, only do it if you have to. I think that's the important thing. But you know, the one thing is we do have to eat, right? So you got to eat, you got to get to the grocery store, you got to also keep yourself, you know, sane, make sure that you look after your mental health in situations like this, Bob, because it's never easy. When you're on your own, maybe you're you don't have family around you, you're on your own, you're having to deal with a situation in isolation, making sure that you're taking care of yourself, trying to keep in some sort of a routine doing a workout, reading a book, taking a class online that you probably didn't think you had the time to do, those types of things to keep your, your head stimulated and going, keep aggressively working out, making sure you look after your body, eating the right foods and things like that. Because it's so easy, Bob, to slip into this path of sitting on the sofa uh, watching The Simpsons for 24 hours a day. Have you, uh, have you been spying on things we've been doing here? Because uh, I will say this that our eating habits have slipped a little bit. You know, you, you stay at home, you get in a little bit of that comfort food routine, right? Yeah. For example, we had chili last night, which isn't a bad thing. It's just probably how much you eat, but we have fallen into that habit. So now after a little more than a week of this, we're like, all right, got to get back on track. The wife got out the workout bands yesterday, that kind of thing. So you sort of get that mindset back, but it takes a while. You know what, Bob? I can't believe that I'm getting this opportunity to sit and have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with you because most of the time we're crossing paths at the Yes Studio. I'm on my way to do a game, the NYCFC coverage. You're doing a Yankees pregame or postgame. We're in your office. There's obviously 10,000 balls of candy sitting there. So I'm coming in to get candy and I see you there. And I'm like, oh, crap, Bob's here. I got to actually have a conversation now with a legend, by the way. An absolute <laughs> legend. It's an absolute pleasure to get a one-on-one -on -one time with you to just sit and talk about life in general because I don't think you realize, Bob, how much of an icon you actually are in the sports broadcasting industry. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're talking to somebody else. By the way, I'm such an icon that you said you actually had to have a conversation with me when you came to my <laughs> office. You would have rather just grabbed candy and kept going. But anyway. That's because I was nervous. <laughs> hey, I do want to ask you something because – if people watch you, they do, they, they, they've gotten to know you, you are like a beacon of energy and positivity. And I love that about you. Um, how has that manifested itself with what you're doing right now when you're staying at home? But I got to think you've already given us some great ideas. Like I never honestly thought about taking an online class. I think yeah. that in itself is like a cool thing that was like, oh, that'd be a good thing to spend a couple hours a day doing. So staying positive, what kind of positive things are you doing through this? Well, staying positive is, is obviously an outlook I think I have in life. And, and I, try, I always try to take the best of whatever situation or whatever cards have been dealt to me. It's always happened throughout my career. And I think it's natural when you're a, a former athlete. And a lot of the viewers who are Yankee fans or Nets fans or Liberty fans who are watching this right now probably are seeing me for the first time. 
they don't know who I am and they don't know I was a former professional soccer player who's working now on the sports broadcast and uh, for NYCFC. Um, you know, as an athlete, you're sort of drilled in to have that positive mentality, to be able to pick up yourself from low situations when you're losing in a game, to be able to get the teammates around you G'd up and ready to rock and roll for the second 45 minutes. Um, and, and that mentality always carried its way through in my life. It comes from my parents as well, Bob. You know, my mum and dad, very positive people. They are they're, they're people who are uh, obviously in the danger zone right now because they're in their 70s now. My father's 69. I shouldn't say 70. He might kill me. Um, but yeah, they're in that danger zone. So trying to keep them obviously going is important for me right now. And having this positive vibe, this positive energy, I think is easy for me to be able to spread news it's easy for me to have an interaction on social media everybody out there can reach me on my social media to have an interaction right now twitter has probably been more positive than i've ever seen twitter before yeah. facebook's yeah. great everybody's telling their story instagram's great everybody's sharing their pictures i think it's phenomenal social media right now in a moment in life where we're all stuck at home. We're in self-isolation. We're all doing the right things. We're showing on social media exactly what we're doing. We're sharing ideas. Everybody's getting creative. And for me, it's just, it's amazing to see. Uh, it makes me so happy to see this positivity out there on social media for the first time in a long time. Yeah, it's great because as you know, it's, it, social media has really kind of deviated over the years. And it's a, it, was, it became a dumping ground in some ways, especially yeah. Twitter, as you know, the instant feedback, the instant everything. That's what's nice. And I hope, like you said, this is sort of a reset for all of us in a way. It's maybe a reset for all of us on social media as well. Kind of take a look at the big picture, like you said. Some of the garbage, just throw it out. You don't need to address it. Let's stay positive. Let's look at all the good things. And uh, I do want to say this. If, if people don't know you from anything else, your line that you used on the one game, the savages, <laughs> what's when they were savages in the box, right? You quoted the urban but I love that. Did you, was that just organic? Did that just happen? Well, you know, since I've obviously started working at the network, I've followed the Yankees closely. And, um, you know, I've followed it more and more. And as you, as you fall in love with it more and more, you follow it more and more. The stories in front and behind the camera, on the field, off the field. You know, for me, it's like, it, it's something... I'm waiting for that story. I'm waiting for that, that something special to come out so that I can grab it and sort of make it mine. And this just, it fell from the heavens. It was unbelievable. First of all, that clip went viral. When he went crazy, uh, it was for me a great opportunity to, to be able to grab that line. But there was only one situation, Bob, where I could use it because yeah. we only have one box, right? <laughs> we only have one box. And, and that goal has to happen inside that box. And it has to be someone who is scoring a goal regularly to say he's a savage inside that box. Yeah. So I knew because it was so close to when the, the incident took place, I knew that I had to have one game that if this was going to happen, I was going to say it. So when the goal happened, um, you know, I, I couldn't wait to say it, but it was just natural for me because I just, I knew it was there. The player scored. And when he scored, I couldn't wait to get the line. And as soon as I did, you know, everybody was just looking at me like, you're crazy. Like you're unbelievable. What are you doing? <laughs> They loved it, um, but for me, it was a special moment as well because the player deserved it. It was a great goal, and he is a savage inside that box, Eber. Took his opportunity in that line. I wish I could have cussed there, but I didn't. <laughs> Keep it clean. It is, it is cable, though. It is satellite. You know, you can pr pretty much do whatever you want. But good, you're being, <laughs> you're being a pro. Good to see. Um, I do want to implore our viewers at Yes to look for um, Ian's promos that he did for nycfc this year those are i mean was that kind of a manifestation of that like it it sort of grew out of that because there i mean the energy that you have the calls that you have with the players and some yeah. of the looks they give you by the way are fantastic <laughs> i knew when the players were coming in that i had to surprise them so first and foremost they didn't know i was there oh good we, no we told all the promo guys and uh, the nycfc guys we were going to do this promo we only got five minutes with each player so we had to make it quick and the first thing i said to each player because i do have personal relationships with the players as you know working around sports you you get these personal relationships so i told them don't laugh whatever you do don't laugh because 
if they laugh, it's natural. And, and I, that's what I wanted. I wanted them to try and hold it as long as possible and then have this natural outburst of laughter. So when I'm screaming in your ear, as you know, Bob, when I come into your office with that energy, uh, for me, it was it, it's so important. So uh, we got great content there and the commercial is available. You can see it. It's actually pinned on the top of my Twitter handle right now. So anybody oh, who wants to catch it, they can see it at Joy Paul Ian on all my social media platforms. So anybody's welcome. Like I said before, they can talk to me about any sport. I, I love New York sports in general. Um, I love sports in general, so I'm, I'm across all of it at the moment. And, of course, that's my passion in life. I've got a question for you, Bob, because yes, sir. while I have you here, I guess you have also got this positivity that comes out of you. You're a great person, and I admire that about you. You're, you're very friendly. You're welcoming. Um, you've been great towards me. But what is it about sports broadcasting that you love so much that comes across to all of us who are watching you? Well, I think probably, and by the way, I want to say this, that positivity that I have, that a lot of that came from my family and my parents as well, just kind of instilled in me. I was also the youngest of four kids. So I was always the guy trying to, you know, get attention and <laughs> do whatever I could to make them laugh or yeah. whatever. Um, I think it's because sports has such passion. And think about it, every game, 162 baseball games, there's passion. There's something exciting that can happen in each game. That, that's a, a half a year of excitement. And then you translate it to football, soccer, basketball, hockey, whatever else sport you're passionate about. So on a daily basis, you can have that excitement. I think the other thing I've always told people that I love about sports broadcasting is that most everything we do is live. So you get one chance to get it right. Ian gets one chance to kick that ball for the game winner. You know what I mean? You don't get a do-over. You get that one shot one moment in time and, and for live broadcasting that's what we have we have one chance to get it right without a safety net and there's a, there's a juice about that there's an energy about that that to this day and i've been in this business now 87 years something like that um <laughs> thing. you know like we we know especially for a yankees audience we're so passionate about this team and it's ingrained in them for a hundred years we can't fake it we can't not give the effort because they're going to notice. So that in itself is kind of exciting. You know yeah. what I mean? Like Absolutely. You have, to, you have to nail it every time. I there's, like something, it. there's something about the New York sports public, the viewer, that I love so much. They want you to be under pressure. They want you to be the latest and greatest, breaking news, and they want to put you on the spot. They want to see you be honest. And that is something I love about sports broadcasting because, you know, I, I've worked for Fox and I've worked for other networks where, um, of course, there's this fluff that goes around what the analysts and, and the hosts talk about. Um, but sometimes, and I've noticed this, especially in soccer and some certain other sports that they've covered, that there's a lot of fluff and it's too much fluff. I like to see brutal honesty. If I'm working with somebody... I'm going to come down hard on them if they're not telling the truth. And I know they're not telling the truth. Right. If they've not done their preparation, I'm going to make sure that I let them know that's unacceptable. And that's what the New York public expect. They want yeah. to see you be brutally honest, be prepared, give them that straight. That's all they ask for. And you do exactly that. I mean, you're, you're fortunate to work with so many great analysts as well, Bob. Is there one particular analyst that you've worked with or maybe it's a, a co-commentator or someone who you've had in studio that stood out to you that was just one of the best there where even you learned from? Well, because I've worked so much with them, both Jack Curry and John Flaherty. Yeah. But what, what I wanted to, and I'm going to actually circle back and ask you a question. What impressed me most about them is not their knowledge. but their, You talk about preparedness. I mean, you know what? And that goes back to a fourth grade oral report that you're doing. If you're not prepared, it's going to show when you're up there, right? It's yeah. the same thing 30, 40, 50 years later. It doesn't matter. You have to be prepared. Those guys always are. They make my job very easy. And what impressed me most about them was the minute Flaherty came off the field and into the studio or the booth, the minute Jack came from being a writer, and I knew he had some TV experience, but to joining us, seamless you would never have known that it was there and it wasn't their first day in television or in front of a camera you never would have known it it was just like boom let's go we're off and running that's impressive that's good stuff because 
they were prepared right from day one. So what I wanted to ask you was the transition from playing to sports broadcasting, was it seamless for you? Was it easy in a way? I hate to use the word easy, but you know what I mean? Well, there's a lot out there that people don't know about my transition over to sports broadcasting. Um, Obviously, I played professional soccer for 14 years. But when I was young, 21 years old, I got hurt in a game and um, missed the next game. So the next game, instead of just sitting in the stadium watching the game like most people would do, I actually asked if I could do the broadcast. Could I do maybe the radio or could I do a pregame or something like that? Because... I was already falling in love with sports media in general. Um, Sky Sports in the UK, where I grew up, in case you couldn't tell by the accent, this is not a San Diego accent. You know, I'm <laughs> born in San Diego, but this is not a San Diego accent. Um, grew up in the UK, Sky Sports took over the world and, and soccer in general, where it's a religion over there. And I fell in love with two or three broadcasters who I was learning from just watching them. And I didn't even realize it, Bob. And that's what our viewers do as well. They're watching and they're listening and they're learning and they don't even realize it. So I did exactly that. So when I became a pro, I knew that my post career would hopefully be jumping into sports media. So at 21 years old, I took the liberty to ask for an opportunity to go into the, the commentary booth and do color commentary. And they said, yes. So I actually have two or three clips from that first ever game. Oh, that's I did. Oh, I have to share it with you. You'll love it. I'll put it on my Twitter as well. It is just the, the most strongest, broad Scottish accent, yeah. just raw material that you'll ever hear. But it gave me this buzz. And it goes back to what you were talking about earlier on. When that camera goes on, that red light goes on, you either have it or you don't. Many people could try to learn it. Yes, absolutely. And it does take experience to get better in it. But I feel like there's certain people who are just natural in front of the camera and they've just got it. And I realized pretty early that I had something. I had something that I could maybe try to build and, and make it special. And I did it before I finished my career. By the time I finished my career, I'd already done 40 broadcasts. That's so incredible. I was, dude, I was ready to rock and roll. And I so, knew, like, so I don't mean to interrupt you, but every yeah. time you maybe either had a break or had an injury where you couldn't play, you jumped yep. up into the booth and did a game. Well, there's another thing you don't know about me, Bob, is they used to pick up the red card, you know, the suspension. <laughs> <rocket and> that, <laughs> so. <laughs> so I used to set out a lot of games and, and I did get hurt every now and again. It sort of helped me back in my career. But that was my, my, my moment. I went into the yeah. booth and, and got some experience. So by the time I finished, I'd already had 40 games, 40 broadcasts. So I knew that was what I wanted to do. Yeah. And um, I got my opportunity a year after I retired from pro sports. I was only 29 when I retired. So I was 30 years old when I got my opportunity and I grabbed it with both hands. It was not about money. It was not about anything other than opportunity to gain experience, you know? So that's priceless, as you know. Yeah. Oh, I tell people all the time, it's about reps. You know, yeah. you're better if you take 50 swings in the batting cage than zero, 500 swings, 5,000 swings, you're going to be a better hitter, you're going to be a better broadcaster, everything. It's about getting those reps, which leads me to the next question. When you do look back at that first game that you did, could you tell the difference? Could, could you look at it and say, I remember that. Look, look how nervous I looked there. Or look how haltingly I talked or something like that. Because I think back to some of my first broadcasts, and yeah. I probably thought I was really smooth, but, <laughs> but I probably looked like I was being held hostage or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, going back and listening to it now, of course, I think you have a tendency to speak very fast when it's your first broadcast because you're yeah. nervous and you want to impress. And sometimes you forget your lines or where you are in your production sheet and you're just like, oh, I got to catch up here. I've just got to make something up until I find where I'm at. So there, there was certainly a nervousness in my voice and I was speaking way too fast. And the viewer wants confidence. And that's what I've recognized through my experience, and I'm only eight years in, which is relatively young into a sports broadcasting career or broadcasting career in general. So for me, it's, it's just about that, that repetition, getting the experience, and just coming across very confident because the viewer, the audience, your fans, the people who tune in simply just to watch you, Bob Lorenz, people do. They tune in just to watch you because you're smooth. You're a smooth criminal in front of that camera. They love that. They feed off that. They feed off the energy and the positivity. And 
I think confidence is very important for sports broadcasting in particular because you want to give each individual supporter who's tuning in a confidence and, and they want to believe what you're saying that this guy knows what he's talking about. So is there, has there ever been a moment that stood out to you in your broadcasting career that has been an outstanding blooper? Like a moment where you've gone, oh my word, I can't believe that just happened. Now, I know there's been many, of course, it's yeah. natural, it's live television. Yeah, yeah. But is there one in particular that stood out to you? Well, there's, there's two things. And I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the first one. It was one where I just rolled my eyes when I realized what had happened. It was in my second TV job. We were coming out of, I had a weekend sports show. And we were coming out of break. And they immediately, with five seconds to go, they told me, oh, you don't have your opening animation. Just go. And we're still in black. And you can hear me quietly drop a four-letter word that begins with F. <laughs> and I was like, and I replayed it. And I'm like, did that make air? And they're like, I may have. But it was, it was real subtle. It wasn't like, a, ah! it was more of like a, Anyway, that one's lost to the ages. The other one, which you can you don't see me, but as I was working Turner for the Super Bowl when it was in Atlanta. Yeah. And I was working my my CNN football partner was Trev Alberts. And he was talking to Bruce Smith, the all pro, the Hall of Famer, on at a separate, they were talking at a plasma. And Bruce got hot, dehydrated. He collapsed on the oh. set on live TV while Trev was talking to him. And what most people didn't realize is he landed about two feet from me, but you don't see me on camera. So I'm hearing his, like, his breathing, and I'm like, oh, my God. So Trev tossed to me. I had to go to break, and then we regrouped and got Bruce off the set and got him hydrated and but that's one of those things where it wasn't a blooper per se, but it's like one of those things, like those moments where you're like, whoa, yeah, what just yeah. happened? How, yeah, how, how about you? Um, I've had a couple. I mean, that's crazy, first and foremost. The, the F word has come out a couple of times. I mean, I like to test my producers, as you already know, and I'm sure the guys who are watching and the production crew there are laughing already. I like to go to the last red line before they go, cute. I always like to talk. I like to have fun. I like to make people laugh. And um, there's been two or three times where I've been working um, uh, with some hosts and, and one particular kid, Abdo, I work with here. She's uh, across Fox and Turner and, and the zone. She does everything. And uh, I always love to make her laugh because she's like a, a school child in the classroom that can't <laughs> control herself. Like she just uncontrollably laughs. So when I make her laugh before they go, Q, go. They got to start reading the auto cue, the, the auto teller, and um, she can't read because she's laughing so hard. <laughs> so she's trying her hardest. So she's like, you, you have to talk, you have to talk on air. We're live, and I, I have to take over and start the show for her right. just because I made her laugh so much. Um, we did have one. I have, well, actually, I have two situations where you know very well with baseball rain delays. And mm -hmm. soccer, it's not so common because they play through rain, they'll play through snow, they'll play through anything. It's like, it's like football. You just play. Yeah. And um, I was covering uh, Los Angeles Football Club, just helping them out. They just started a new football club here, the soccer team. And um, they wanted to do their broadcast. So I thought, okay, first game, I'm going to go down. It was July. Uh, team was playing away in Houston, so they were on the broadcast. And this is like YouTube TV or something like that. I don't know what it is. And I'm like, okay, all right, here we go. So I do the broadcast. I'm already exhausted by the time I get there because it's during the World Cup. They are in Houston, and in Houston, they have this rain delay. They don't have the luxury of playing in a dome or anything yeah. like that. This thing is like on delay because there's lightning near the stadium. So for one and a half hours, we had to stay live on air while this game was in delay for wow. one and a half hours. And there's no commercial break longer than 60 seconds. So you're just talking yeah. for an hour and a half. And I'm thinking, okay, that's a one-off. It's never happened in my career, hour and a half, crazy situation. They were like, yeah, yeah, we, we look forward to inviting you back in. Anyway, <laughs> they did invite me back. They were also playing against Houston, but this time it was in Los Angeles. And I yeah. thought, nothing can go wrong. We did a pre-production show where they were making fun of me being the weatherman, holding an umbrella, <laughs> the sun shining. 
I'm like, yeah, haha, it was fun. It was great. The, the crew's awesome there. You'll never guess what happened. During this game in Los Angeles, they had a lightning delay again during this game. We had a delay for another hour in the game. So we had to talk for another hour in the middle of the game. Nobody could believe it. So that was uh, one story that stood out to me. I've had m multiple stories in my young career, but yeah. it's certainly uh, one of them. How about this one for you, Bob? Because yeah. I know a lot of people in, in New York and around the tri-state area, they are aspiring sports broadcasters. They look up to people like yourself and, and they want to know whatever information they can get. Do you have a tip? Do you have some advice? Or what would your advice be to a young broadcaster who's at home even right now? They're stuck at home. They've got a microphone. They've got a camera. Is there a piece of advice that you would give to someone who's young, maybe going through this situation right now? Honestly, we already talked about it. Repetition. You got to do it. You know, you're going to be, whether you're doing a podcast, you're doing a, um, what, what we're doing right now. Yeah. I mean, maybe if you're, this would be a tip. If you're hanging out, you're self-quarantined and your buddy is next door, but you can't go hang out with him, do what we're doing right now and do it as if it's a sports show or it's a talk show or, you know, you'll get comfortable with what you say and cadence and how long you talk. And if you play it back, you'll realize, wow, I just prattled on for three minutes. I don't need to do that. I can yeah. speak for a minute, 30 seconds. that will be fine. I would think something like that with the technology they have today, which was certainly not available when I was growing up. I mean, we had the old Sony tape decks and big monster cameras, three tubes and not these little, <laughs> You can shoot it on your, you can shoot, you can do a news story on your iPhone right now, you know? So it's crazy what they have now, as far as technology goes, like what, what we've gone through. I mean, of course I know what I've gone through and the technology. I can't imagine. I mean, you, you're, you know, God knows how older than me, Bob, I, I love <laughs> what it is you've gone through. I mean, when you started back in the day, now you see the technology It's made such a difference to the viewer as well. Right. They get to see a better product. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Everything digital, everything 4K or getting there. Um, yeah, we had the old, you know what, next time you're in the office, I've got a bunch of old three quarter inch tapes from back in the day that I still need to go through, by the way. <laughs> and I mean, the video quality was just horrible. Yeah. You know? And now, I mean, people are spoiled by everything that they can shoot, everything they can see. Yeah, it's, it's a great era for technology. So if you're a kid, you want to be in broadcasting, I would take advantage of it. Just kind of do what we're doing right now. Everybody talks about the candy in your office, right? <laughs> and for me, I knew about it. It was like a myth that was out there. Everybody talked about, oh, go see Bob, go talk to Bob, go check out his office. You hungry? Go to Bob's office. I'm thinking like, what is going on? First time I stepped into your office, the candy's everywhere. Yeah. What's the story behind the candy? Why you got so much candy in your office? Is it just it, like being friendly? Well, yeah, normally Ian won't stop and talk to me. So it's a way to suck him into my world and <laughs> have him actually have a conversation. I get lonely. <laughs> now, uh, you know, it just started out as one of those things. Like, I think I threw a few bowls of M&Ms out. Then people started coming in and I started expanding the base. And now I have like four kinds of M&Ms, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, Twizzlers. I try and throw something healthy like almonds out there. We have one guy, Glenn, who loves Skittles, so we throw Skittles out there now. So, yeah, it just started as, you know, something nice to do. And it's funny, though. I will tell you this. When I come back from, let's say, Yankee season ends and I get a couple weeks off and I do a Nets game, I come in. Those bowls are decimated. They are wiped out. It's like a nuclear holocaust hit my office as far as candy goes. It's pretty funny. Dude, I can't tell you how great it is to have this opportunity. It's unfortunate in the situation that we're in, the circumstances, people in isolation, but content like this is so vital, so important yeah. to get it out to the people right now because this looks like it could be a long road for people. Bob, you're a legend. For me to get this opportunity to sit and have a conversation with you, it's an honor for me. And I can't thank you enough because in my young career already, there's, there's five or six people I really look up to, to look, to learn from. Every time they go on air, see if there's a little nugget that I can take and, and maybe make it my own. And you're one of those guys, Bob. And, and thanks for everything you do. You're, it's a pleasure to know you as a friend, but to, to get to work alongside you, it's, it's an honor, man. Ian, Ian, I feel exactly the same way. You embody everything that's good about this business. And again, you've been in this business a short time compared to me, but your energy, your passion, it's off the charts and I love it. So I can't wait to see you in person, but let's do this again. If we have to, 
this way, right? I'm here. Anytime you want to talk about it, the latest news, the greatest news, because I know there's a lot of fans out there who want to have this content. They want to hear about what's going on with the Yankees, what's happening with the Nets, uh, the Liberty, of course, NYCFC. We can introduce maybe a few more soccer stories to those supporters who are out there who don't know the game so well. And, Absolutely. And, and moments like this, you know, we create some content for people who are just craving something right now. We're here for you. And, follow us, follow social media, everything you can. And, and in terms of just doing what we're doing now, you know, people want sports to come back, right? So I know you're getting a little stir crazy. We all are. But we keep doing the things, the social distancing, staying inside. Uh, it's going to speed up that process. It's going to get soccer back faster, baseball back faster. Everything's going to come back faster. The things that we love will come back faster. If we just do these, we're able to get past this. Good talk yeah. to you, bud. You too, brother. Take care. Keep safe. Look after the family. And I can't wait to see you in person under different circumstances. You too. See you soon.